Good evening, everyone. I'm Dorothy Goldeen, Chair of the Southern California Chapter of Art Table, and I'm pleased to welcome you this evening to our third panel, Art Table Talks, uh, Cultural Affairs in Los Angeles County. There are, as most of you know, 88 cities in the county, and most of the larger ones have both public and private developer requirements in relation to arts. Uh, three of um, the municipalities represented here today, Santa Monica, Pasadena, and Culver City, have those requirements in place. And one, what is, what, 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 which person does not look like the other's program? <laughs> um, would be Eve. Uh, but, so we're going to talk a bit about public art, uh, private art requirements, but also a kind of larger landscape around the visual arts. Um, and what municipalities are doing to support it. Two minute overview of the county program and our director of civic art, Margaret Bruning, is here. Uh, you have a summary on your chair. Um, the county's public art program is, I believe, the newest of anyone who's sitting here because it was only adopted by the Board of Supervisors in 2004 and began functioning in 2006. Since then, we've completed more than 50 projects ranging in size from $10,000 to a million, um, and just dedicated in the past week two major projects at health centers, one at Martin Luther King, um, that was uh, two arts commissions, one more about to be dedicated, and wonderful pieces, if you have a chance to go there, and the other in the high desert in Lancaster in a hospital. Um, so this is a new evolving program for us. We're also attempting to inventory and catalog everything the county owns and has acquired over its 150 year history. Um, we have succeeded in doing that work with our ex excellent collections manager, Claire Haggerty, who is here. Uh, partially, about 75 or 100 or 125 pieces so far, mostly the large three-dimensional pieces. And we actually have just received an allocation from the county starting next year to do the first ever complete inventory of what the county owns. So this is actually an art collection that belongs to all of us. Um, and it would be good to know what we have and be able to assess its condition and make sure that that important history say, stays alive. So Santa Monica is what we would typically refer to as a full service arts, local arts agency, which essentially means that um, the city of Santa Monica provides support to the arts in every way that we can think of to provide support for the arts. Um, and we do that in part because our cultural plan identified that 43% of our population makes their living in the arts. Now, that's the arts broadly defined, that's the creative sector, it includes you know, everything from architecture to digital music production, but nonetheless, it's a very important sector of the population in Santa Monica. Um, I'll start with our public art program. We have two, we have one for what we build as a city, so you know, what we would call our public, public art program. And then we have our requirement for the private sector. The public one is extremely old. It's been around since the 80s. Um, it's working pretty well, but um, you know, if, if I had my druthers, I'd probably rewrite the policy. But you, you probably, you, you know, it's never a good idea to kind of mess with something because you never know what, what might happen. And it's only 1%. Um, and basically through that, um, we have a certain amount of flexibility. Uh, I work with the Arts Commission and we commission artists for projects that we've identified would do well with public art. Our most recent commission um, was for the newest park in downtown Santa Monica, Tongva Park, and we commissioned Inigo Manglano of Valle. Um, it was also our largest commission to date. It was about half a million dollars, and that's the most we have spent um, as a public entity on commissioning a, a work of art. We also have a public uh, a requirement of developers, um, so anybody who's building within Santa Monica. And that requirement is much more recent. It was adopted in 2007. 
So it's very up-to-date and very open-ended and very flexible. It allows the developer to satisfy the requirement in three different ways, by providing um, original works of commissioned art on site, by providing um, subsidized space um, for cultural facilities. So, you know, it could be a rehearsal space for a nonprofit organization or office space for um, an arts group. And the third way in which it can be satisfied, which is of course my favorite way, um, is that they can pay just 1% of that requirement into our cultural trust fund. Because, I say it's my favorite way because obviously that allows us to spend the money. <laughs> um, and it's a way that we fund a variety of activi cultural activities in Santa Monica. The good thing about it is because Santa Monica is such a small city, it's only eight square miles, there are no issues on where the money can be spent. It, can, it doesn't have to be, you know, stay with the building that generated it, it can be spent anywhere within Santa Monica. Um, the two most recent um, private sector completed commissions, they're almost not yet visible to the public, they are kind of, if you peer behind the fences, are a wonderful new piece by Renee Petropoulos and a piece by Catherine Wagner, um, which have been installed um, on Olympic and on Ocean um, in the new related project that's just being finished right now. Fences are still not down, but, but the artwork is great, so I encourage you to go see it. Um, we have about a $450,000 grants program, so that's another way in which we support the arts. Um, that grants program just got a 10% increase, um, so we're very, very excited in, our, in this year's budget. It's the first increase in a while, but um, it, it's great that it's a 10% increase. One of the things that I'm particularly proud about is that we as a city provide direct support to individual artists, which very few cities do at this point in time. Um, so a big chunk of that money, $60,000, goes to provide artist fellowships. Um, so that's a pretty um, wonderful thing that we're able to do. And, you know, the rest of it is pretty traditional um, support to nonprofit organizations. Um, but we support the arts in, in other ways as well. The city has a number of cultural facilities which I oversee from the Annenberg Community Beach House, which has um, cultural program year round and hosts um, three different artist residencies during the course of the year. A choreographer in residence, a writer in residence, and a theater company in residence over, over the course of the year um, and presents free rehearsals and, and um, pre, um, exhibitions. Um, we also have a gallery down there where we change the exhibition about four times a year. We have a small theater, the Miles Playhouse, which is a 200 seat theater. Um, we have the Civic Auditorium, which of course is closed right now and I don't know what its future will be, but it is a cultural facility. And, and then the city supports the arts in other ways, um, which are sort of harder to identify, um, but really critical. So for example, um, the city provides subsidized studio space for artists at the airport. Um, so um, all of those studios are way below market and um, council has designated them as such. So um, I, I think what's most exciting for me about working in Santa Monica and, and I would like to acknowledge my predecessor, Maria Luisa de Herrera, who's here. So I'm building on her great work um, in Santa Monica. But um, I think what's so exciting is that it's a community where the arts really have a seat at the table. And whether it's in developer agreements, or it's in planning, or it's in facility development, we're thinking about ways in which artists can play a role. But we're also facing tremendous pressure because the reality is that Santa Monica is the equivalent of a virtual gated community. Um, the price of entry is so high and we're losing artists. The city of Pasadena has had a public art program since 1988. It's one of the older programs. We've had a program that was specifically created for the downtown and old Pasadena redevelopment areas. Um, and it coincided with the growth of the preservationist movement there in old Pasadena. And um, anyway, as a result of that, we created four years later in 1992 a program that uh, expanded the public art requirement for private development throughout the city with one exception, and that was for Northwest Pasadena, which was considered to be kind of an impediment to the redevelopment areas there. 
Cultural Affairs in Pasadena um, is well established. We also have a grants program. I am a little bit different. I am the other end that looks a little different than the rest of you. Um, we have an individual artist program, a grants program for local support for pro uh, programs that serve our city. We also have um, a couple of nice links with our PUSD. Um, we have student exhibition um, art. We support their district-wide exhibitions. Explain for people who may not know what PUSD is. And that is our uh, school district, Pasadena Unified School District, which includes not only the city of Pasadena, but also Altadena and Sierra Madre. So we have uh, developed with them a program called My Masterpieces, um, which is utilizes the collections of our local arts and cultural organizations, including the Huntington, which is actually not in the boundaries of Pasadena, by the way, uh, Norton Simon, et cetera. But who's counting? Nobody. We don't. <laughs> Uh, the collections then are used to develop a curriculum for uh, PUSD students. And so the second graders, all second graders, we had over 1,400 second graders now, are exposed to public art through the um, public art walking tours that we created for the city. A special cre uh, curriculum was created for them. So they have, that's their only uh, out of, um, outside field trip is going and taking a public art walking tour. So they learn about some of the critical issues that we all face in um, public art, uh, materials, siting, um, selection of artists, and of course they also have some content um, conversations and they do some work back at the school. So that's one of the ways that we have tried to infiltrate public art um, not only for development in terms of private development, we also have a capital um, public art program, but also within the schools. Um, so we do have an individual grants program, and our annual budget is about $900,000. We give out about $140,000 in grants. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Oh, we produce Art Night twice a year, which is our arts open house. We support our arts and cultural organizations by producing the event, and it's, I would call it an art walk, except you can take the bus. We have bus routes which take people throughout the city, and actually that's kind of part of the interesting dynamism of the event, is that you get on the bus with people and you get to ride to different venues. Everything's open for free. We supplement that with grants for private programming, including um, anything from poetry to music, et cetera. So we try to expand the arts in our city to en envelop a diversity where our mission really is to expand access to the arts for all of our community. My program's a little different. We share some common elements, certainly, with all the other cities here and, and a little bit, too, with the county. But um, the city of Torrance and, uh, has a very large cultural arts center, which I don't know if any of you have been. We have an Armstrong Theater. We have the Nakano Theater. And we have this beautiful cultural arts center that has classrooms. We have four dance studios with sprung hardwood floors. There's a ceramic studio, jewelry making studio. And my staff um, does all the programming for all these classes. And overall, we, serve, we offer about 200 classes just in the visual arts annually for about 2,500 patrons. We also have a very active exercise and yoga and martial arts and dance program, too. Altogether, we serve about 10,000 people a year. Um, and uh, most of my program is in what's called the enterprise budget. So we're actually responsible for bringing money back in. And we bring in about a million dollars just through that. So it's quite big and it's quite active. And so who are our teachers? The teachers are all artists, of course, and people that are teachers, not, you know, that want to be there and teaching. And we, we have programs for youth and adults and at all levels. So it's a very, very busy program and it's exciting. The other thing that we do that's pretty unique is um, we have an art museum, a contemporary art museum called the Torrance Art Museum. And it's kind of ironic to actually be at Mark Moore Gallery because my curator used to be the director here. So, <laughs> so we share lots of stories. But um, anyway, the Torrance Art Museum uh, was, became into existence in 2005. It was a Jocelyn Center. And I know that there are certain cities in Southern California that were Jocelyn Centers. 
and it is a contemporary art museum. We like to say it's the premier visual arts space in the South Bay, and I actually think that that's true. If you've seen it, it is really a beautiful space. It has great light. We have... Um, Jocelyn Center. Oh, there was a man named, I think, Arthur Jocelyn, who wound up donating these community centers in various communities throughout California. And I know, like, Redondo Beach has one, Manhattan Beach, but I think there are other cities, too, throughout California. So we had a Jocelyn Center, and then it became the Torrance Art Museum. Um, we are not a collecting museum. We're really more like a Kunsthal, which is more of an, uh, an experimental exhibition space. Um, we, I have the current exhibition schedule there. We open a show on Saturday. Usually they're large group shows that are thematically based. There's really three main places that we show. We have a large main gallery, a smaller gallery, and then recently we turned a room into a video projection room that's dedicated to video. We also usually have large sculptures on the patio and um, things like that. We're doing programming now, we're doing films and, and artist panels and that kind of thing. We probably show about 150 artists a year and they're really from here to around the world. Um, I have a very creative curator and I don't know how he does it, but artwork shows up from China and Australia and <laughs> all these places and we never pay for it which is fine. Um, it's a very small budget. It's about 140000 a year for everything and that's um, my curator, two assistant curators, a preparator and a volunteer coordinator. Nobody's full time which is very challenging and uh, we recently actually a uh, group of people started a support group for the museum which is good. Um, so that's uh, mostly what we do when we have about 6,000 visitors annually and that also includes school groups and, and different kinds of groups that come in. One other thing I wanted to mention is um, last May I initiated a South Bay Museum and Gallery art crawl and part of the reason for that is um, when I came to Torrance, I really had no idea where it was. And I had been living in near West Hollywood, and it was like, okay, there's a job, find it on the map, you know, oh my God, it's so far. Everybody thinks it's really, really far. And the truth is, it's not. And the South Bay has actually a lot of things going for it. There's several new museums, and there's some other more established places. So we developed this South Bay Museum and Art Crawl, and it was a free event um, where we, and the maps are back there. We had eight organizations just say they would be a part of it. They were all open from 12 to 6. And it was really just a marketing, a cooperative marketing um, opportunity to get people to come to the South Bay and see that it's not that far. They're good restaurants. And to also have some, um, you know, mass. I can go to this one place and then I'll go to the other place and that kind of thing. And, and uh, I have to admit, we did not have huge numbers of people, but on the other hand, there was a great deal of goodwill that was generated. And I think um, next year it will become a much bigger and better event. And I'll have some help in planning it, which would be very nice. Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty common knowledge that 20 years ago you didn't get off the freeway unless you lived or worked in Culver City. And Culver City has gone through quite a remarkable transformation, especially in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, some of those um, changes were happened rather organically, like this Culver City Arts District. We were always asked, did the city actively go out and pursue art galleries? Um, in essence, no. Um, it happened over a very short period of time, starting about 10 years ago. It was fairly organic. It had to do with property values, the size of these spaces. And uh, the galleries were leaving other parts of LA where uh, the rents had become too high. And a few isolated incidences, the city was giving permit fee waivers. But uh, really, we don't take a lot of credit for that. Um, the two live theaters, the Kirk Douglas Theater and the Actors Gang, those were actively solicited by the city. And those are uh, very real partnerships with the city. Um, in terms of cultural affairs, um, the city's public art program was established in 1988, and from the very beginning, Same year. seems Same to year. have been a very pivotal year for public art. Um, and from the very beginning, it applied to both uh, city development projects as well as private development. It has always been at 1%. 
Um, and until 2001, the program was actually overseen by a volunteer arts committee. And the planning commission made the final decision with a recommendation from that arts committee on um, permanent art commissions. In 2001, the city council established um, a cultural affairs commission. And that commission, um, unlike my colleagues here at the table, we have a performing arts grant component, a public art component, but we also are involved with historic preservation. So my title is public art and historic preservation coordinator. I have a third title I've had for the last two years, but we'll talk about that maybe a little <laughs> bit later. The recession has made some interesting job amalgamations. I order all the fuel for the city. <laughs> um, when redevelopment was eliminated in February of 2012, um, cultural affairs, there were three full-time positions in the city. We were 100% funded by redevelopment. And we were offered either a severance package or reassigned to other departments in the city. Hence, my colleague Susan Obrow went to the Veterans Memorial Building, and in true Susan style, she has turned, you know, she has made lemonade from lemons. And I was offered an analyst position in transportation, and you should have seen the first day. I mean, I faced 38 mechanics, and they looked at me like, what orchid hothouse did you just come out of? <laughs> So I lobbied because both public art and historic preservation are written into the city's municipal code. I looked at the HR director the moment she handed me my letter and I said, and who's gonna do these two programs? Is the city council gonna repeal those out of the municipal code? And it took another three months after that conversation for them to work out some arrangement by which I sort of did a hybrid of the two jobs. So in one minute, I'm ordering 9,000 gallons of unleaded fuel, and the next minute, I'm talking to somebody in Tom Main's office. I have two desks and two offices. Well, all of that, hopefully, pending city council approval at the end of this month, I will be reinstated full-time in cultural affairs and will be working directly out of the city manager's office. Something to celebrate. So in the meantime, I know a lot about compressed natural gas, and my spreadsheet <laughs> skills have really improved. Going to come in <laughs> handy one day. So back to public art. We've always been at 1%, and the public art ordinance was not, it, it was updated over the years, mostly from an administrative standpoint. We had a very controversial change in the mid-1990s where Culver City adopted an option for developers where they could actually actually um, designate the architecture of their building or a portion of the architecture as art in lieu of commissioning permanent public art for their site. I have this many letters in that file in protest. This was going to take you know, commissions away from artists. But I am happy to report that to this day, I think we only have six such designations. It's been almost 20 years. And when I came on board 11 years ago, I went right to the primary instigator of this um, and sat him down and he and I agreed that in order to make this something real both for the architects and for the community, we would bring in a peer review panel of design professionals. And that really ratcheted up the criteria. So I think it's, it's taken much more seriously on, on both counts. Um, we have a very small performing arts grant program in terms of dollars. Um, we usually fund between 14 and 16 organizations emerging and established every year. And then I also oversee um, historic preservation, so I get to deal with the attorneys at Sony and all of their development projects. Um, in terms of public art, we have about 100 pieces in the city. The largest commission in terms of scale and dollars is the Sony Rainbow, $1.6 million, 94 feet high, 188 feet across. And um, an artist represented by this gallery, Yoram Wahlberger, is doing a permanent piece. We have a couple development projects at Washington National, so that just recently was approved. 
in terms of other cultural organizations, you know, uh, they've been coming into Culver City or have been in Culver City and are finding new homes. The Jazz Bakery will be building a new building across from City Hall. The Venda Museum, who've been over in Fox Hills for the better part of 10 years, will be moving into a new permanent home at a former National Guard armory, also owned by the city. And it goes on and on. So. Thank you, panelists. That was amazing. Thank you all for coming this evening.